Welcome to the Rockbrook Church Podcast. Our hope is that today's message brings you hope and clarity for your spiritual journey. We love hearing how God is working in your life. Feel free to share any stories of how this message gave you a new perspective and hope. Email us at church at rockbrook.org to tell your story. God's hope for your family is not to live a life just focused on your family, uh, but to be a light to the world around you. Uh, To not conform to the culture, but to see your life and your family from his point of view with faith, to be transformed, not conform, but to be transformed and serve him. And when you get to heaven, one of the things that you're going to do there is serve God and God wants you to get some practice here on earth, okay? And we'll all... Well, all, we all in life, by the way, serve something. So there's not an option in life of whether or not you will serve. We all serve something in our life. We either serve ourselves or serve our career or uh, serve some other thing. The question is, who will you serve in your life? Romans 6.13 says, Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. So do not serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God, for you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Don't serve sin. Don't serve something other than God. Things apart from God uh, are going to end in death. Give yourself completely to God and serve God and the life that he gives. I've titled today's message, Serve Life, Living a Life of Service, Living a Serve Life. God doesn't want you to live a salt life. He wants you to live a serve life, okay? Psalm 116, 12 asks this question. Let's read this one out loud together. What can I offer the Lord for all he has done for me? Have you ever asked that question? God, what could I, your blessings, what you've done in my life, The grace, forgiveness, the direction, the hope, the promises. God, what can I offer you? Now, amazingly, the answer to this question truly is is nothing. There's nothing you can give to God to earn his grace. There's nothing you can give to God that would repay what he has done for you. Nothing in and of ourselves could earn his favor, could pay him back. He freely offers his mercy, and it's more than you could ever deserve, ever could earn, ever could repay. And then he goes the extra mile that also in his mercy and in his grace and in his plan, in his goal of creating a family, he includes us in the family business of his work, and he empowers us to make a difference, to share in the building of his kingdom. And he says, yes, there's something you can offer me. And we're all hungry for that. We're all hungry to feel that our lives matter, that our, feel, that our lives make a difference, that we can offer something significant, that there's something significant happening in our lives. We're searching for significance. But you have probably found and learned that significance doesn't come through your status. Significance is not found in a salary. Significance doesn't come from success. Significance comes through service. Jesus said, it is only through giving your life away that you find out what it means to really live. It's upside down from what you thought. That's why having a serve life is so important for your own soul, your own significance. The question I want to ask you this weekend is where are you making an unselfish contribution? Where are you serving? Just as a a, a volunteer, not for anything that you uh, uh, would get out of it or any, uh, any earthly form of significance because if you're taking notes, you might write this in. God wants us to contribute something back. He doesn't want you uh, to, uh, he doesn't leave you here rather on earth to just be for yourself. He wants us to learn to be selfless, to learn to be generous, to learn to serve others uh, with whatever opportunities and talents and and, and time that he's given you. Now, this is actually one of the primary purposes of your life. Like we talk about, well, what's God's purpose for my life? Well, why am I here? Giving back and making a contribution. When you give back, when you serve someone in Jesus' name, there's a word for that. That word is called ministry. 
in the Bible, the word service and the word ministry are the same word. They're the same thing. And so we are to serve God. But how do you serve a God who is invisible? How do you give back to a God? How do you offer God something, offer to a God who is invisible? You serve God by serving others. You were made to make a contribution. You weren't just here to play, and you know this is one of my favorite illustrations, is too many people are playing whack-a-mole with their life. What's whack-a-mole? Do you remember that game where a mole pops up and you whack it and then you whack the next one? Many people are playing that with their life. By that I mean a problem pops up in their life and they say, I've got to take care of that problem. Then another problem pops up in their life, I've got to take care of that problem. This problem popped up again. I've got to take care of this problem and this problem and this problem. And before you know it, years go by, decades go by, you lived your whole life, you come to the end of your life, and all you did was solve problems. What a waste. I don't want to live life for my problems. You don't want to live and die for problems. God offers a purpose to live for. And you can't make all the problems go away, but you don't have to live for them. You can make it to where they just become mere distractions as you live a life of purpose. One day, God's going to ask you, what did you do with the life I gave you? Well, I solved a lot of problems. Uh, Made a lot of ends meet. The Bible wants you to say, I fulfilled a ministry. I serve. That's what God wants you to say. Every believer, every member of Christ's family is a minister. Every time you help somebody else in Jesus' name, you're ministering to that person. Jesus said, even a cup of cold water in my name? He said, I see that. I recognize that. That's an act of service. But God says, you know what? I don't want you to just contribute something back by yourself. I don't want you to minister alone. I want you to do it in the context of a greater thing in the family of God. Now, why does God require this? Why can't I just go out and serve on my own? Why do I have to be connected uh, to a, a, a greater thing? Let me let you in on a little secret. God is just as interested in what serving does for you as he is what it does for other people. God is doing something in you as well. Uh, I wanted to read something from someone, uh, their, families, or their family serves in several different areas on the Dream Team. And they said, our family serving has done even more for us than it has for others. Uh, don't get me wrong, we love the difference it makes for people, but through serving, we've learned how to change our focus. When the worries of life are so overwhelming, we've learned that we're probably just thinking about ourselves too much. When we're worried about a problem at school or a problem at work or home, we try to change our focus onto helping other people. That's made us better at work, better at school, better at home. So why serve on a team? Let me give you a couple reasons. The Bible uh, often compares being together in ministry, serving uh, in a greater context, making a difference, uh, compares that to the world of gardening. And 1 Corinthians 3 8, let's read this one together. The one who plants and the one who waters work together for the same purpose, and both will be rewarded for their own hard work. No one can meet all the needs. No one person can meet all the needs in another person's life, even. It takes a team. For instance, uh, sharing your faith with someone. It takes several people. Uh, to share their faith with someone. It it probably took several different things for you to be interested in God. You know, several encounters. God uses the family of God. This person is going to witness to them. Uh, This person is going to challenge them. This person is going to share what God is doing in their life. Uh, This person is going to maybe share some apologetics or some truth. Uh, This person is going to be the one to to pray with them and get them to cross the line and they convert. Then uh, it's oftentimes another person who uh, baptizes them. And then God's going to use this person to help them grow. And then God's going to use this person uh, to help that person share their faith and bring it full circle. It's all of us working in our lives together. And someday we'll celebrate uh, the reward and that Jesus was Lord of it all. And that was all about what God was doing in their life. So we're a garden and serving 
uh, on a team is more effective. That's the first reason. It's just, it's more effective. Another reason that you serve on a team is that we need each other. Like we are a family. We're, we're a we're a body. The Bible says we're the body of Christ. Romans 12 says, just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body and we all belong to each other. I belong to you, you belong to me. If you cut off a finger, is it going to live on its own? No, it's got to be connected to the body. And God says, you, you are a, a, a you're a garden, you're a family, you're a body, and you need to work together. God wants to use you in ways that you maybe never expected. So sometimes uh, people have said to me or asked me, uh, well, what, could, what do I have to offer? Let's say, what difference can I make? And the more I've studied the Bible, I've actually changed my response to that. Because my response in the past uh, would probably be what you expect. Oh, well, you have something to offer. You can do great things for God. Uh, you can contribute. Uh, it, now, I, I, I actually say, you're right. <laughs> uh, you don't have enough on your own. I don't have enough on my own. No single one of us has enough to offer that could really make a difference. That's why we need other people in our life. And God wants to use you, but he wants to use you on a team in the family of God. You're part of a body. Even the Apostle Paul served with others. Even Peter served with others. Even Jesus built a team. And if they did it, well, I probably need to as well, right? So God wants us to contribute something back, and he wants us to serve in a team. That's why at Rockbrook, uh, we have the dream team and why we're celebrating them. Who is the dream team? Uh, the dream team is a group of compassionate people serving the ministry of our church. Everyone has something they can do to impact the lives uh, of others. At Rockbrook, every member is a minister. You can express your unique God-given design to make a difference as you serve God by serving others, all for the glory of of God, all in the context of this greater thing. Everything that you see happen around here happens by people serving the ministry of our church. This slide that you're looking at, uh, someone on the admin dream team put it together, someone on the worship team and productions broadcasting it right now. The outline you're holding in your hand, the worship guide that you have is put together by someone, handed to you by someone on the team. Uh, the microphone that you're hearing this out of, someone on the, the team right now is making that possible. Someone serving the ministry of our church, the coffee or tea that you're drinking. Someone on the hospitality team serving the ministry of our church. Made that happen. Uh, the worship team is made up of people who are serving. They're serving the ministry of our church. Your kids and students are being ministered to by people who are serving the ministry of our church, serving on uh, the team. A card you get in the mail, small group leader opening up a, a space or their home, celebrate recovery. Couldn't happen without people serving the ministry. When we do baptisms, someone served on the dream team to set up the tank and make, the, make a way for people, make available, take it down for uh, other, other weekends and uh, so many different things. Anything you see happening, the, the trunk or treat that event that we're planning for the end of the month. An events team is helping lead the way and make that happen. And many other teams are chipping in. It's an outreach to the families and so many other things. I wasn't trying to list them all there. That's even my point is there are several, several ways to serve. And a team makes it, it takes a team to make it happen. And I want to thank you for your faithful ministry, faithful service to the ministry of the body of Christ. Uh, Patrick Jitto, who leads our dream team, asked a couple of people to come and just share what Rockbrook has meant to them and then even what sharing on the team has meant to them. And so I wanted us to listen to one of those now. Would you help me give a warm uh, 9.30 Rockbrook welcome to Betsy Thompson, please? Come on now. My husband Mark and I have believed in Jesus as long as we can remember. We have enjoyed the connections and friendships we've made in our small group and worshiping at Rockbrook for several years. Everything changed for us four years ago. Mark was playing basketball when he collapsed and flatlined for seven minutes. 
He had survived a massive heart attack, and they had discovered a 100% blockage in his right coronary artery. Mark's small group leader was the first one at the hospital. When everything was shaken, our small group was there. They were instrumental in our healing process. After this event, attending worship at Rockbrook wasn't the same. We couldn't sit through a song or a service without crying. The words from Pastor Ryland echoed. The songs from the worship dream team played over and over in our minds all week. Without thinking twice, we got baptized, went through growth track, and joined a dream team. My husband and I decided to start serving together on the worship dream team. He still serves as a bass player. With him being a musician and loving Christ, it was an easy choice for him. I currently lead a free market small group. We sew and craft, serving the needs of our community. We listen to each other's stories. We're in each other's lives, supporting, encouraging, praying for each other, all while doing an activity we love doing. I can't imagine doing life without these ladies. I also serve on the Info Resource Dream Team and the Hospitality Dream Team. It is there I find comfort and joy. On a dream team, we follow Jesus. The greatest commandment is, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your soul. Matthew 22, verse 37. We love people. We do that through fellowship. By serving on a dream team, you are in continual fellowship with one another. We remember why. Christ died for us. His body was broken for us. His blood shed for us. And we choose joy. Rick Warren gave us this definition of joy. Joy is the settled assurance that God is in control of all the details of my life. The quiet confidence that ultimately everything is going to be all right and the determined choice to praise God in every situation. We can all fall into the motions of life and think we are getting what we need, but God can speak to us the clearest when we follow him. Thank you. Thanks so much, Betsy. I want to go to a place in the uh, New Testament where Paul, uh, the writer, asks a few rhetorical questions. Look at it with me. He says, is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from his love? Any fellowship together in the spirit? Are your hearts tender? And we'll come back to this word, compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, Loving one another, and here we see it again, again, working together with one mind and purpose. And so here we see the expectation, working together. Then uh, he's going to point out some things here. Uh, He's going to point out one thing that can absolutely ruin a church, and then uh, a thing that builds up a, a church. A thing that can ruin a family, a thing that can absolutely build up a family. Verse 3, don't be selfish, don't try to impress others, be humble, thinking of yourselves as better, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. So he's going to go on now, and if you've seen your outline, it's kind of broken up differently. Uh, uh, in your Bible, you see it the same way. Uh, because in the original language, what, what we're about to see would have been a hymn that they would have sung. And it's giving examples of Christ's attitude. And we're seeing, okay, this is what Jesus did, and this is some examples of his attitude. And so we're to have this attitude. And so here the song begins, Though he was God... He did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, 
that at that name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. A great place to just say amen and say, God, I agree, Jesus is Lord. And so Jesus led the way for us. He says, you want a song, you want a thing, you want an account of how Jesus became Lord? This is how he did it. And he gave up all of his privileges. He gave all this up. Humility, service, others, obedience to God. So Paul asks, is your heart compassionate? Is it tender? Then lead this way. It's such a fascinating motive, compassion. Uh, Compassion is a concern for someone else, a concern for someone who's struggling, a concern for someone in their suffering, concern for someone in their misfortune. It's really what motivated Jesus uh, on behalf of other people. It was his compassion. And so we won't do a deep dive on all of these, but I just wanted you to see this, look at this with me. In Matthew 9, 36, it says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. So what, what caused Jesus to want to give direction and give people a shepherd it's his compassion next in Matthew 14 14 Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat and he had compassion on them and healed their sick what was what motivated Jesus to heal the sick it was his compassion for them in Mark 1 41 moved with compassion Jesus reached out and touched him I am willing he said be healed what made Jesus willing It was the compassion in his life. Mark 6, 34, Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat. He had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. How do we get the teachings of Jesus? It was his compassion that motivated his teaching. In Luke 7, 13, when the Lord saw her, his heart overflowed with compassion. Don't cry, he said. He ends up doing an amazing miracle uh, for someone, for a family. So yes, what motivated him? Yes, he saw the crowds and the people and would do things for the people, but then he would just do things for an individual, for a family. What motivated him? It overflowed out of his compassion. And then uh, later in the New Testament, John says in 1 John, if someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? So we see compassion is a concern for someone suffering or in their misfortune, but it's something that is shown. It's more than wishing someone well. It's more than a concern. Compassion is more than a feeling. It's an action. It's an action. The action of compassion. So Paul asks in that Philippians verse, are your hearts tender and compassionate? And I want to say to our church and to uh, the team And those serving in ministry, I've seen your compassion, I've seen your grace, I've seen your kindness, your tenderness, your generosity, and it impacts people. And yes, compassion is a grind. Serving is hard. But I'm amazed how you do it with so much joy and so much compassion. And before we finish today, I wanted to have us hear from one more person. Uh, This is Aaron Fish. Would you give another warm Rockbrook welcome, please, to Aaron Fish. Thank you. Um, In each of the first four services at Rockbrook that I attended, I experienced Ryland naming in a loving and compassionate, non-judgmental way the struggles that we face in life, like addictions, pain, brokenness, wounds, resentments, some things that often aren't shared up on a stage. So the thing I noticed first at Rockbrook was that it was real, it was genuine, authentic, And it was okay to talk about the problems that we face in life, the struggles, the wounds, and the scars. In response to those things, I heard about grace and truth here. I was, and I am still dealing with those struggles, those wounds, and scars. And I needed, and I still need, to hear and be surrounded by that grace and truth. It was after that fourth service that I told my wife that this is where we belong. John 1, 14 through 17 says, 
or it tells us that Jesus came in flesh and his glory was the fullness of grace and truth. Verse 17 says, or and then it says that we receive then grace and then more grace. Verse 17 then tells us that the law was given through Moses and grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Rockbrook has helped me see a Jesus that is full of grace and truth. My wife and I have been here at Rockbrook for almost four years, and I have seen so many people here who work to love and care for the broken, just like Jesus does. I'm not saying they're perfect. They're human, and they don't pretend to not be. But for the most part, the masks are off. I love the grace that I see, that I hear, and that I feel here at Rockbrook. It makes me... It brings me joy to serve alongside people who strive to exhibit love and grace like Jesus. I serve on the first responders team. I'm a greeter with the hospitality team. I'm a couple small group leader. I serve in our harvesters mobile food pantries and I serve and celebrate recovery. In In leadership, teaching, leading step studies and as an accountability partner. I got involved in some of these dream teams because of the grace that they demonstrated to me first. In all of these areas, along with my other dream team members, I am gladly sharing the same grace and truth to others now, with all of my being as my purpose in life. I believe it is one way that we are called to follow Jesus as we extend unmerited grace to others out of a love for him. I recently gave my testimony at Celebrate Recovery, and I included this statement towards the end as I, re, as I um, referenced what CR is to me. And it applies to Rockbrook for me too. And it is that I have found no other place with the love, acceptance, grace, compassion, and joy as this place. So thankful for Aaron's willingness to share that. And I think it's just so many things that we... It's a vision fulfilled of the kind of church you want to be and want to be a part of and one that's real and uh, one that is compassionate. Uh, this message would be missing something if it didn't include this, and that is you can join us on the team. You're welcome. You're wanted. Uh, friend, you're needed. Uh, I think the team makes it look uh, better or easier than it is sometimes. To be quite honest with you, like we have needs you could fill. Uh, kids rooms I'd love to see open, stuff we'd love to do, uh, but we, we need the people who are willing to grind it out uh, with us. And uh, Our team does an amazing job, so appreciative, so thankful. I think I, I, speaking on behalf of the team, it's missing you. We want you to be a part of it too. Uh, we've moved our growth track one week uh, this month, so next uh, Sunday afternoon on October 8th, uh, we're going to do step one of the growth track. And I'll uh, lay out, you'll hear the purpose of Rockbrook. So like the lens that we look through of how we lead Rockbrook Church, what's driving our church. Uh, And the next one on October 15th, uh, we'll talk about essential habits that that keep you growing in your Christian life. Step three, uh, some people told me this is their favorite. It kind of focuses on them and your shape, like your design, and can help you um, in ministry, help you work and your family and different things. And then step four on October 29th is uh, to join a team, one of the uh, many teams I've mentioned here today. Uh, maybe you've uh, done all these or you've been on a team at one point or you're off one or uh, you've done these others and haven't done that. You can just come to the October 29th if, uh, if that's what you need and join us. It's Sundays from 1 to 2.15. There's child care. Um, you can look on our online, rockbrook.org slash growth track or dream team for more information today. Uh, but I know we've done a lot of clapping today. But a just truly a heartfelt thank you for those serving the ministry in our church. Can we do that for just a moment? God bless you. Whoa, 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 whoa. If anyone has an air horn, I'd take it. I'd love it. Absolutely. All right. We're going to finish today instead of with a prayer. We're going to make our dream team. We're going to uh, declare our dream team declaration. And we're going to read it out loud together. Maybe you're familiar with this. Maybe not. But let's stand together. And worship team, you can come on up. And we'll read this aloud together. Notice I did not say a soft, but aloud, all right? 
Because God has called me to serve my generation, I will value worship over wealth, we over me, character over comfort, service over status, and God's purposes over possession, positions, popularity, and pleasure. To my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I say, however, whenever, wherever, and whatever you ask me to do, my answer in advance is yes. Wherever you lead and whatever the cost, I'm ready, anytime, anywhere. I want to be used by you in such a way that on that final day, I'll hear you say, well done, good and faithful servant. Come on in and let the eternal party begin. God bless our dream team. Yes. Thanks for joining us today. We would love for you to get connected to what's going on at Rockbrook. Visit us online at rockbrook.org for service times, small group information, and other ways you can discover your purpose here on earth.